Thank you so much for talking with me. I really appreciate it. I'm really, really excited. I've been excited for weeks. <laughs> oh, good. Well, anything for a fellow Megan. <laughs> yeah, you even spell your name right. <laughs> That's right. We do. So, uh, no, I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm excited to talk to you. Cool. Yeah. So I discovered you like embarrassingly kind of late um, because a friend of mine told me that you had been doing some really interesting essays about identity politics. So I came across your essay um, about your affair with the intellectual dark web. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like totally blown away because I was like, this is happening to me. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you probably got a lot of responses like that. Did you? Yeah, I mean, it was funny. It was, um, it was, it's the kind of piece that it was actually part of a larger project that I was working on. And I wasn't planning on publishing it as a standalone piece. But suddenly, everybody was talking about the intellectual dark web, I guess, Barry Weiss's New York Times piece, uh, back in last spring, uh, kind of kicked the door open on that whole subject. And I had been like, immersed in this world for a couple of years already, uh, so I felt like I needed to kind of get in on the on the conversation and, and write about it before it got sort of done to death. So yeah, it's a big, strange piece, um, uh, just kind of framed around the way I, I I was I got I got divorced a few years ago and I ended up like substituting the companionship and various entertainment options that had been afforded to me in my marriage for for watching uh like you know Brett and Eric Weinstein on on YouTube so sort of a <laughs> well somebody asked me if I was embarrassed to have revealed myself to be such a like a lonely hearted loser and I thought well I hadn't <laughs> even thought of it that way I didn't perceive you as a loser <laughs> in your defense um but Thanks. yeah, and I, I, I suspect, yeah, like I said, I suspect a lot of people kind of felt like I did, which is that they'd been sort of having similar feelings and like not really knowing how to deal with it. So maybe had this like private hidden <laughs> right addiction <laughs> to, to watching YouTube videos and, and listening to podcasts with people who we weren't supposed to be listening to or talking about. But uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, like I, I guess, I mean, I think that what I was experiencing and what you were probably experiencing and what a lot of people were experiencing was this thing where we started to feel like we couldn't talk about certain ideas. We couldn't talk about, we couldn't question certain ideas. We couldn't question certain narratives. And it was right. really, really impossible to have a nuanced conversation about politics. Um, and ideology, especially on right. the on the left or as a liberal or whatever oh, you identify yeah. as, right? And not just politics, but culture and just society and and social norms and just kind of you know existing in the world as a thinking, curious person had really changed. I mean, the thing is that what's been weird for me is that I've been I've been I've been writing professionally. I've been publishing for. 25 years. And I've always written controversial things. I mean, the reason that I've had, you know, the success to the degree that I've had it is because um, I was always able to sort of pick topics that would be polarizing or, or look at things from a slightly, uh, slightly different or counterintuitive, surprising uh, perspective. And, um, you know, when I started off doing this in the 1990s, I would write something controversial and maybe the worst that would happen or actually the best thing that could happen was that people would be divided on it. And, you know, some people would write letters to the editor and this would require like getting a piece of paper and writing the letter and getting a stamp and an envelope and putting it in the mail and maybe somebody at the publication would read it and maybe it would appear six weeks later and and I would just go on with my life and my career and in fact having a controversial piece of writing would then lead to more opportunities to write this was actually considered part of the job of being a writer of being a journalist of being a sort of public thinker and I I really kind of cut my teeth on that way of of thinking about being in the world and about being a writer. And, and then I, you know, I was a, an opinion columnist at the Los Angeles Times from 2005 to 2015, essentially. 
And there again, I, I wrote all kinds of things, always from the perspective of, of a liberal and someone who's always identified as a feminist and being on the left. Um, but I didn't want to just take the standard predictable party line. I mean, that to me is just totally uninteresting. So, so really, I'm not doing anything differently than I ever did. If anything, I'm much more careful mm-hmm. uh, than I ever was. And um, I don't want to say paranoid, but I guess I'm, I'm much more mindful of, of the consequences and I probably choose my words more carefully than I ever have. Um, but yeah, just, you know, even, you know, I, I would say that around 2015 or so, uh, the climate, uh, sort of ideological climate really changed so that um, people on the left just started policing each other in ways that I think are potentially really dangerous. Um, I, I mean, I know you've had your journey as <laughs> this, <laughs> but here yeah. you are intact. Yeah. So what, like, what do you see as kind of the tipping point? You say 2015 was the year when you started noticing that real change. What do you think it was? Yeah. I mean, it's funny because at that point, Trump was was barely in the conversation. Mm-hmm. Everyone, I mean, we were all just very happily in the Obama administration. Everyone assumed that that Hillary would be the nominee and that Hillary would be the next president. I don't think there was a sense of panic uh, of the sort that we have now. Um, and I don't know, maybe there was maybe there wasn't enough to do or to talk about. So people just became uh, like. The, the the number of hot takes and the the number of sort of like endless pieces about Emma Sulkowitz carrying her mattress around Columbia University and and you know the the sort of the way that the social justice conversations were arising and then being metabolized um, maybe I'm just kind of thinking out loud here actually I mean maybe there the the, the political climate was sort of at a lull and so all these kind of um, secondary and tertiary concerns were able to come to the forefront and they just got kind of like hot taken away. <laughs> I mean, I was definitely, I was always interested in the, the conversations around consent and the, and the campus sexual assault uh, policies and Title IX and, and those sorts of debates. And so I had written a couple columns about that and about, about Sulkowitz. And I started to notice that um, you know, I would write a fairly anodyne column, um, just kind of uh, pushing at some of these things a little bit and kind of questioning, uh, you know, just kind of looking at ideas around female agency, as we call it, or, you know, the, it, whether or not how sexual assault should be defined, whether or not statistics like one in four, one in five women will be assaulted during her time on campus, how those hold up, how they came about whatever, pretty, pretty um, innocuous columns, in my opinion. And suddenly, like, they would be taken apart on Jezebel, or they would be annihilated by somebody on Tumblr. And then that would get traction on Twitter and on social media. And suddenly, like some person who is not like an official member of the media, and who happens to have some kind of personal stake in this issue, would have a a response that was then amplified in such a way that suddenly this what would have in the past been a very fringe or frankly irrelevant response was now legitimized and made part of the conversation. And I think that that's, that started to happen around 2015. And then by the time Trumpism came along, we were just totally off to the races with that. And we, we see what's been the result. Right. Yeah. Like, because now on Twitter, somebody who's like you say, like, wouldn't have really been relevant before, didn't necessarily have any expertise in the subject at hand, wasn't a journalist, whatever, could right. suddenly get, like, their, their really, like, short, like, superficial commentary, because it was 140 characters yes, at that time, people. go yes. viral, and it just is, right. like, this big takedown, like, and yeah. We, yeah, it's not very uh, yeah. in-depth or necessarily, like, really oh. even true. No, and I mean, I mean, it's a double-edged sword because obviously, on balance, it's probably a good thing that more people have a platform. It's probably a good thing that that everybody has the ability to speak. You know, when I was starting off uh, in journalism, there were only a few outlets. Like every week, people read the New York Times, they read the New Yorker, 
they read uh, whatever happened to be in the Atlantic or Harper's uh, that week or month. And that was sort of what the, you know, the cognoscenti, as I call it, or this kind of, you know, the sort of cultural gatekeepers in the media. The, the conversation was really limited to what was being said in just a handful of publications or, you know, then I guess by extension on like television news or, you know, CNN 24 hour cable, but, but really like the, 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 the kind of, you know, the, the standard bearers of the, of the sort of public commentary were only to be found in a few places. And uh, in a way, obviously that's incredibly elitist. A lot of people were kept out for all sorts of reasons. Um, many of them unfair, a few of them fair, like reasons having to do with talent, but reasons having to do with lack of access, uh, lack of resources, just the, the bottleneck in terms of getting published in the New Yorker, there's all kinds of structural barriers to that. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, Twitter, social media, great. I think it's it's great that people, that anybody who has something to say can say it. Um, but there's always gonna be fallout from progress. And in this case, uh, you're just, we're, we're seeing people who are who go unchecked. I mean, you know, the thing about writing for mainstream uh, media is that you have editors and you have fact checkers and you're actually accountable for what you're reporting. Um, and unfortunately, we've now reached a point where even, even journalists from those major outlets are going and saying things on Twitter are not even accountable for what they're saying on, on mm. Twitter. So mm. really, I, I think, I feel like we've almost reached a point, a tipping point where people are going to get fed up with this and it's something's, something's got to give. I'm not sure what it's going to be. Well, yeah. And I mean, I think that that's why the, the intellectual dark web, it's kind of a silly <laughs> term. So right. it's awkward to call it that has sort of popped up because I think people are kind of getting sick of the, the, news cycle, the like culture of outrage, the kind of same politically correct opinions being spouted over and over and over again. And, you know, like, I mean, part of what I think is interesting about what I'm going through right now is that I feel like I was a part of that. Like, I've always been quite far left and involved in, I was writing about radical feminism. Right. So yeah. I wasn't even like a liberal, like <laughs> I was like way yeah. over there and spent a lot of time kind of criticizing everybody else for not doing it right. And like not <laughs> <laughs> like not kind of being radical enough and not having like forceful enough opinions. So I was always like, you know, like I was pretty dismissive of the idea of nuance because I interpreted nuance um, to be like an unwillingness to take a hard stance. And so, right. or oh, to yeah. avoid having an opinion on a controversial yeah. issue. Yeah. yeah. So, but today, now I'm finding myself really fighting for nuance and being really frustrated about these rigid labels and these kind of black and right, white representations of politics and like this idea that everyone is either left or they're right. And I sort of feel like I'm kind of fighting for humanity. Like I'm fighting for people to be treated as human beings instead of being placed in these categories and I just I the pushback against that is like crazy like people don't want to hear it like I find like a lot of people on the left and people in feminism don't want to let go of those categories and it's not you know I get it because I feel like I was there at one time but I feel like it's impossible to have a real conversation because we're not even speaking accurately. Like in one of your essays on Medium, you referenced um, that project, Hidden Tribes, a study of America's polarized right. landscape, which found that the vast majority of Americans are neither hardcore conservatives nor progressive activists. I'm quoting you now. Instead, re researchers concluded that two thirds make up what they call the exhausted majority, a cohort containing distinct groups of people with varying degrees of political understanding and activism that share a sense of fatigue with our polarized national conversation, a willingness to be flexible in their viewpoints and a lack of uh, voice in the national conversation. So it's like the vast majority of people in the world don't fit in these boxes, don't like these boxes, don't like the conversations that we're having. And yet the leftists or the progressives, who are the people who are supposed to be representing kind of the underrepresented majority, are completely ignoring this reality and don't even want to hear about it. 
Yeah, I think um, according to that Hidden Tribes study, the what what would be called the the woke left, I guess, is really only eight percent of the of the population, at least the population they were studying. And frankly, that that seems kind of high <laughs> to me. Um, I, you know, I guess it's my my concern. It's it's really hard because you know, even the word nuance has almost become weaponized, right? It's like, you know, I've heard people go on Twitter or wherever and say, oh, there's another nuanced take, you know, sort of rolling their eyes as if nuance, anything that's nuanced is really a sort of dog whistle. There's another uh, term that comes up a lot. I mean, I, I guess, I, I think what it is is just that it's, I, I'm, I'm worried about just sort of becoming one of these lefties that's criticizing the left as a sort of knee-jerk response, uh, and I mean, I guess, I, I, I guess, what I really want to do is just kind of fine-tune our outrage. Maybe it, it's because it seems to me that outrage is obviously very appropriate to the moment and incredibly understandable. But my concern is that these visceral expressions of outrage have almost become a substitute. Well, they've definitely become a substitute for meaningful thinking about the real causes and problems, uh, the real causes of problems and, and potential solutions. And the thing is, I don't have any solutions to offer myself, not or not very many anyway. I'm just a writer and an observer. But I think it's important to start speaking up against some of the shallower, less useful manifestations of this outrage before it starts to backfire in a big way. I mean, we've just... We're just coming off of the weekend with the Covington Catholic School video, and that just makes me so nervous because I feel I I it it was such a wormhole in, in so many ways. But I I, I want to know like how many Trump voters, how many more Trump, how many Trump, how many voters has Trump gained as a result of this weekend? Right. How many people who were sort of in the middle or on the fence or indifferent or didn't care? How many of them got so irritated? with mainstream left-leaning media and the way this whole thing was handled that they just want to own the libs even more than before and that that makes me incredibly scared i just i i you see that whole thing unfolding and you see all these you know blue check uh twitter users prominent columnists media figures just jumping on the bandwagon and it's like what are you, what are we doing what are you guys doing yeah well yeah and i mean that obviously it's not just like people who might vote vote for trump who are really frustrated with that you're frustrated i'm frustrated every single like radical feminist that i talk to in real life i didn't bother getting into it online i mean i don't i honestly don't spend that much time in doing online debating i don't have time or the interest really but uh <laughs> i uh you know they were all so frustrated with that conversation too and considering the amount of people who watched that whole thing go down and were probably really annoyed and upset about the like crazy misrepresentations that happened and yet the 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 hot takes and the virtue signaling continued you know like i still saw something on jezebel a couple days that were like oh they gave this kid a platform to tell his sob story and it's like why are you hanging around to this why are you going on with this why is there why are you so unwilling to have an actual honest conversation why do you not want to know the truth about what happened I know. Is it because they're trying to save face? I, I don't. Or do they do they truly believe it? Like, is is the ideology just so deeply rooted? I mean, the comparison to religion has been made many times. Um, this is not an original observation, but you know, there are some corners of the social justice conversation that really do feel like you know, evangelical. They feel like evangelicals. But the funny thing is. Christian evangelicals are all about forgiveness, and that's the component that's missing yeah. with this with this particular evangelism. I don't know, you know. I mean, for a long time, I, you know, I I would try to I would say to myself, and I still say to myself, it's not the students that that bother me. I mean, I think one way to be really reductive about all of this is to, is for people on the left to say, oh, well, you're just beating up on student activists and, and they've always been this way and, and, and it's you know, equally 
actually more even more reductive for people like Tucker Carlson to feature a campus craziness segment every night or you know I don't know if it's him but Fox News they, they can't get enough of this I mean they will dine out at any opportunity on some ridiculous campus spat some professor getting dragged for you know a, a misstep um, some ridiculous protest but the fact is, students have always been ridiculous, and I, I was myself as a student, not necessarily in that arena, but in plenty of other ways. Um, what's more disturbing is just the way that the cultural, you know, cultural institutions, the media, ha have completely played into this. It's like the students are setting the agenda, and it's not even all the students. It's like probably less than 8%. I mean, let's right. not forget. You know, we're hearing about some uh, some dust up at Oberlin about uh, they, they don't like the General Tso's chicken or or the the sushi because it's culturally appropriative or whatever it is. You know, that's not most students. That's just a tiny fraction. That's a tiny fraction of Oberlin students, and Oberlin students are a tiny fraction of college students overall. I I don't understand why this this minority is setting the tone uh, on a national cultural level. That's what I find so disturbing. It's, it's almost like the, the gatekeepers, sort of these you know, middle-aged uh, you know, people making the executive decisions are being held hostage to this, this kind of you know, infiltration of, of woke millennials. Or, or they're just trying to come, off, come across as young or something. It's almost like dressing too young for your age or something like that. I, I, I don't I don't know what it is. I, I really wish I, I really wish some like psychologist would here comes now my dog is gonna no, no. <laughs> She's I really up. wish somebody would actually like drill into what it is sort of cognitively that is making people respond like this. Yeah, I mean I've thought about that a lot too, because I also am like, why are these twenty year olds driving the conversation? I mean because it's not just, I mean, I, I guess I do see a lot of what's happening culturally as being driven by, and this this outrage cycle and these protests against things when they don't even know what they're protesting and this trying to shut down conversations and no platform people and creating, pretending that differing opinions are violent and harmful and triggering, blah, blah, blah. But I it's like, it's also just, it's like when I was in my 20s, like, or in my young 20s, I would say for all my 20s, but let's just say specifically young 20s, I was an idiot. Like, I didn't know what I was talking about. And how could you? I mean, you have so little experience. You're just learning. Your brain yeah. isn't necessarily fully developed. And I it sort of seems like it's part of this anti-hierarchy thing or like an anti-elitism thing where it's like anybody over the age of 40 or 50 has too much power so we have to render them irrelevant I don't I don't know I mean <laughs> I'd like to think it's because they think we have too much power I mean I don't think that's true I'm just saying no. that's what they <laughs> I have very little I, you know I think I've been thinking a lot about the generational divides, and I've been thinking and writing a lot about, um, you know, particularly the weird position that Generation X is in. So I'm like a, a total Gen Xer. I'm, I'm very much in that cohort, and I think that we are in this. We have there's this weird phenomenon where we're not digital natives. We're we're the last generation to have been full fledged adults by the time the internet came around. Uh, you know, we, my first job, I used a Selectric typewriter. Um, we, I had a Rolodex. Uh, we did have computers and we had like intra office email. We could email each other within the office, but, but that was it. Um, you know, and I'm not that old, like I'm not 50. Um, but I, I remember that time. And so we, so it's, I, I, I definitely have the experience even though I have adapted and obviously I work in, I write for digital media, I use a computer, I have an iPhone, but it doesn't feel, it doesn't come all that naturally to me. And so I am in this position of feeling kind of obsolete before I'm even 50 years old. It's like we've been rendered irrelevant before we're old. And I think that one of the things that's happening is that younger people don't really need us anymore. I mean, I've noticed p 
people just don't want our advice the way we wanted the advice of our elders. I mean, there was when I was in my early 20s, there was nothing I wanted more than to be mentored by people, women especially, but anyone really like 15 years older than me, 20 years older than me. I wanted to know how they did it. I wanted to know about their careers. And I see this now with my students, with anybody else, like I could tell them what I did when I was starting out, but it's not relevant. The business has totally changed. The business model has changed. The world has changed. So I think that there, there's almost like an information gap or a sensibility gap. They don't need to go to us. They can also just look up anything on Google. <laughs> the idea of going and asking somebody for advice or for information about how to do something, I think is itself a relic. And so when you lose that dynamic of mentorship or even just conversation about how to proceed in the world and how to think about the world around you, um, you you end up with like a lot of stuff missing. And mm -hmm. I, I, that's something that I've been kind of trying to, to take apart in my mind because I think it's, I think it's pretty big. I think it's manifesting in all sorts of ways. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was interested because you wrote crit critically about um, what you called the language of the left. So like the overuse of terms like <laughs> patriarchy, white supremacy, misogyny, intersectional and then all these other terms that we attach phobic to right so phobic. there's transphobic islamophobic biphobic homophobic um i've heard femphobic oh. <laughs> um and that's different from misogynist you can can you be uh a... i don't think femphobia is a real thing but i have okay. <laughs> seen it i mean I, I i guess there's there's a lot of words that i see thrown around online that i don't actually think really mean anything but they're cool words to say and they make you look right. um very i i don't i don't want to use the word woke anymore but you know what i mean yeah i know i know i mean it's hard to talk about any of this without sounding like you're dismissing all of it that's the problem is like there's also this this phenomenon where before you make any point, you have to go through this list of, of to be sure's. You've got to, you know, go through the catechism as of, of course I support trans people. Of course I'm a feminist. Of course I'm on the left. Uh, of course I hate Trump, you know, just yeah. in case you were unclear on that. Like, I'm not right wing. I'm not right wing. Right. Like, don't right. put me in that's, the, I'm not a like, Nazi. Oh, <laughs> you don't test too much. So, yeah, I, I, I have a hard time, I'm still trying to figure out how to kind of talk about the uselessness of a lot of these terms without just sounding like I don't care about the meaning behind them. Um, so I guess what I would say is, you, you know, you start throwing terms like white supremacy and misogyny around uh, at every chance you get, it's going to diminish the importance of actual white supremacy, which is a, which is a tragedy. White supremacy exists, and it's awful, and it needs to be fought um, at every turn. But that doesn't mean that it exists and is what is chiefly operative in every example everybody cites. It's just it's almost become like a way of shutting down the conversation. You call somebody a white supremacist on Twitter, and they're going to shut up. You call somebody a misogynist a rape apologist on Twitter and they are a columnist or some kind of writer or public thinker, their boss is going to tell them to shut up. And that is the way that this kind of extreme left ideology is shutting down, as you would say, and as I would say, <laughs> holding our noses a little bit, <laughs> nuanced conversation. <laughs> And that is very, it's not just scary to me, it's profoundly depressing to me as somebody who like lives for nuance. Like that's why I became a writer. That's why I got into the business. And to see so many people afraid to, uh, to work in it and with it is just like the absolute worst outcome you could have. Yeah, and I mean, and it's not just nuance, but I feel like it's honesty. I feel like it's authenticity. Like, I feel so desperate for honest conversations and for authenticity because you don't see it because the way that um, virtue signaling goes online is it's like, oh, you, you think perfect thoughts all the time? Because I don't. Like, you have perfect politically correct opinions? Because I don't. And 
I just yeah. don't buy any of it. And it's boring. And I don't, it doesn't get us anywhere. It's all just about narcissism and, you know, proving how good and, and right you are. And it just can't possibly be true because we're all human and we're flawed and we all exist in this world together. Right. I mean, and also, you know, denying somebody their humanity is a big phrase that comes up a lot. And I just want to say denying somebody their complications is denying them their humanity. Totally. These things, I, I, I just, they seem to be, um, there, there's like an inherent fallacy here that, that somehow uh, you are you are erasing somebody if you uh, ask them any questions, if you wonder anything, if you want clarification, if you want to engage in the complexities uh, of their context. That to me is just, for one thing, it's completely anti-intellectual and it's also just illogical. Um, And so I, yeah, I, you know, I'm kind of in a way, I'm a little bit hopeful and maybe naively so about this rise of like the public event. People are starting to now want to go see people sit on stage and talk or even people like you and me have this conversation right now, having like face to face, verbal spoken conversations. And I think that that may be some of what's been missing over the last couple of years, because like trying to sort out your thoughts and and try things on for size and think about ideas that may or may not be fully formed in your brain, that's the kind of thing that does not translate at all on social media. On a place like Twitter, you have to be either on one side or another, you've got your limited number of characters and you've got your hashtags and your, you know, emojis and that's what it is. And that sort of, um, platform, that aesthetic really, cause it is an aesthetic is the opposite of actually kind of just sorting through ideas the way in the intellectual tradition, really. I mean, I don't, in, 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 I don't think that, you know, any philosopher worth his salt or her salt uh, is not going to try to do philosophy on social media. It just makes absolutely no sense. So if we're going to think about thinking, maybe we should accept that it's just not going to be possible uh, in the formats that are dominating the cultural discourse at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, what I find weird is that if we if we want to have good ideas, we have to challenge our own ideas. So to me, having conversations with people with different perspectives, different experiences, different opinions is I mean, first of all, it's really interesting to me because I'm so bored of the the leftist conversation that we're allowed to have. Right. You want to be surprised. Yeah. Right? And you want to challenge yourself. Yes. Like what yes. if my ideas are bad, then I, I want to know that so that I can have better ideas. Like Everyone's ideas are a little bit bad. Well, they can't be perfect, <laughs> right. Right? right? But, and, and, you know, our ideas and our ideologies are so much impacted by our own perspectives and our own experiences and who we are. But, you know, like, the, the resistance to even listening to people we disagree with or people who might... I think there's a fear of changing our mind. This is what I think. It is. I think that people don't want to hear what... So, for example, I think... I, I Like, I mostly have conversations with people on the left. That's why I talk about the left all the time. I, I'm only recently starting to have conversations with people on the right. So I can't, I can't speak to them <laughs> with such familiarity. Them? I really like them. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, and some of them, yeah. some of them aren't on the right, but they're, they're called, they're labeled as right, um, because they, they don't take the proper leftist or liberal positions on, on certain things. But, you uh. know, like, I just find it really interesting. And um, there's this, yeah, there's this resistance. And I think it's because people are scared that if they start listening to these ideas, instead of dismissing them and rejecting them, then they might have to change their minds and they might have to acknowledge, oh, hey, maybe these people that I put in this box over here actually do have valid things to say, even if I don't agree with all of those things. Or maybe I might agree with some of those things. And then what do I yeah. do with myself? Because what's my identity then? 
Yeah, I don't know why people are so uncomfortable with having a rapport with somebody where they can sort of pick and choose their areas of agreement. It's almost like I, I, you know, I'm sure that you and I probably disagree on a number of things, but we can still sit here and have like a really interesting, useful, enjoyable conversation. And that's actually the entire point of having any conversation. Yeah. And for some reason, I've noticed this in sometimes in students and younger people, it's almost like they get very, very panicked if somebody who they assumed they were ideologically aligned with more or less um, suddenly kind of shows signs of having an opinion that is like off, you know, not on that, not on the right track, you know, sort of over in left or right field. It's like their whole world is thrown off. Like they can, I, I've seen, I've had interactions with young people where like I'm asking them something and I'm just trying to probe a little bit and it's like, oh no, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. She's going to say it, she's going to say it, she's going to be, she's going to betray us and oh no, and what do I do? And that is just not something I ever saw before maybe like 2015 or 2014. You know, when I was in college, that was the whole point. Like that was the whole idea of being a grown up in the world was having discussions and dialogues with other grown ups where you could kind of deal with the ways that you disagreed. And to me, that's like the fun of talking. So I, I don't know. Again, I would love to sort of know what it is, whether it's generational or whether there's some sort of wiring, there's some sort of cognitive wiring that has changed. I, 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 I sometimes wonder if, if people who just, who grew up with, you know, with the internet all the time or people who use apps all the time, um, just are just used to being able to pick and choose their information streams so narrowly that they're able to filter out everything else. Um, and so again, I try to be mindful of those differences because it's very easy for me as a generation X person to sit here and say, Oh, you guys should just like get over yourselves because my wiring is completely different. Yeah. That's a good point actually, because we're able to filter our information and conversations and what we're exposed to so completely that, I mean, it's obvious. It's, it's, I mean, this has been talked to death. This isn't a new idea at all. But what happened with the last election where we all thought Hillary was going to win because we were only talking to people who hated Trump. And meanwhile, there's this the whole rest of the country is on right. a different page than us. And we have no idea because we're stuck within our little circles. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. This is something that I think about a lot uh, in the context of the sexual consent uh, discussion. Because, you know, or just, you know, the, the me, a lot of the, the Me Too conversations, they get, they kind of fall down across, you know, along generational lines. So people of my generation will say to millennials, like, you know, toughen up, uh, you know, just say, learn to say no, get out of the situation. Um, you know, it's, it's not sexual assault. If you didn't explicitly say no, you know, you could have walked out of that room, whatever it is. And on balance, that is pretty much my attitude. However, I think it's easy for people like me to forget that the entire dating arena has changed dramatically. Um, I didn't, when I was in my 20s and single and young and running around the city, I didn't, I wasn't dealing with Tinder. I wasn't going on dates with total strangers, with people who weren't even just people I didn't know, but people who didn't know anybody I knew, everybody that we interacted with, we would meet, we had met in some real face-to-face -face way. Yeah. And we also had just more experience having face-to-face -face interactions. I think when you're, when, when you've like developed your emotional and social sensibility like through texting and and on apps i think it might be asking a lot then to expect somebody to get out to negotiate a sexual situation um in a th that might be a little tricky like it's hard to it can be hard to finesse that kind of thing and to to get out of it to get out of a tense sexual situation where you don't know how the person is going to react you really have no idea i think that it's probably it's 
it's easy for older women to to forget that there are so many new factors. There's so much going on that makes that that whole sphere a lot scarier in many ways than it was for us. Yeah. So that's something that I I, I really try to to keep in mind when thinking about all this stuff. I think that, yeah, and I think there's another thing, too. So, because I feel like I'm sort of in a middle ground. So, I'm 39. I've, I've never used a dating app before because, like you, everyone that I've ever dated or hooked up with has always been somebody that I already know or, like, a friend of a friend or in the same social circles. And, I mean, and in Va- Vancouver is, like, fairly small for a city, so, and I've lived here my entire life, so you know a lot of people. Like, it would be right. so weird. I would never go on a date with somebody that I didn't know. Like, I would never go on a date with some total rando who didn't know anybody that I knew. Right, or... the, ran- the rando factor, like, yes. No, I, I'm not interested. D- that should be like an app, yes, rando date. Yeah. <laughs> but, but at the same time, all of my friends who are single do use Tinder and Bumble or whatever, and a lot of them like it. Um, so, but I, I, I guess, I, I think part of it is, is probably that because I think it's weird to go out on stra- dates with strangers. There's no accountability. You don't know anything about them. You don't know how they are. Um, your friend has not been able to vouch for them and say, oh, he's okay or he's a creep or whatever. But as I'm approaching 40, I feel like I sort of lose touch with what it was like to be 20 and to be to end up in sexual situations that I don't want to be in because I'm just a more confident person now. And I don't want to, <laughs> I'm going to preface this with something, obviously, yeah. so I don't get in sure. trouble. <laughs> like, I don't want, it's not, you know, victim blaming, like, you should be more confident. But the reality is that at 20, I was extremely insecure, or, you know, 19, 18, whatever, in comparison to now. Um, I wanted male validation a lot more. Um, I didn't know myself very well. I wouldn't have been as good at navigating difficult situations. Um, I, I'm not saying I always make wise choices in who I date now, but I feel like I'm making more intentional choices and I'm not going around hooking up with a bunch of dudes like I did when I was 18. I'm sort of dating a person who I already know and it's you know so it's a different situation and so I think it's easy to sort of lose touch with because I do remember um back when I was 20 there were no dating apps there wasn't you know much going on online like I got my first email account when I was probably 18 or 19 um but that kind of stuff still like I remember having those experiences where I would end up having sex with somebody and having not wanted to and sort of been pressured into it and eventually giving up and then feeling really gross and upset about it after having negative, you know, experiences. Um, and nothing really horrible happened to me, but I, I, I mean, I, I'm getting so off track, but I am, I am really interested in this conversation about me too, because I do think there's a generational divide and I do also think it's a bit weird to see everything aired publicly online and it it makes for again a real lack of nuance because you end up with lists of names for example and you don't necessarily know what the man on that list did and some of those men did really horrible things and are dangerous and predators and some of them did something fairly innocuous and everybody's kind of lumped in together and it's sort of it's hard and it's such a hard conversation to have because I don't want to excuse male behavior and I want men to be accountable and I do want men to change their behavior to women but then at risk of making excuses for men you're kind of like well like come on like he did something shitty when he was 18 and now he's banned from social life and can't get a job ever again and you say you want accountability, but you're not even allowing him to participate in a conversation. You're not allowing him to change. You're not allowing him to be accountable. And I don't know what the end goal is. Yeah. You know, I, I think that I just think we're in a really unusual and intense and really extreme moment. I think this, I think that the men who, came of age in this particular moment are going to end up being, they're going to have their own sort of like sociological label. Like I feel like if Time Magazine is around 20 years from now, which it probably won't be, but if it is, 
like there'll be a cover and it'll say like the men of me too how are they doing now <laughs> yeah and I don't think the men that that got me too i mean like the boys that are coming of age now the the boys that are in college the the boys that are having to you know to really who are the who are not if not personally but generationally the the cohort that's gonna take the hit for this like there are a lot of the, the, we are in as extreme a moment as I think we're likely to be in and there are people who are gonna get caught up in it and be casualties of it sometimes fairly sometimes really unfairly and I think that it's gonna be it's gonna leave a mark I think that there will be men who ha have something imprinted on their psyche now um, that that marks them as being part of this particular period of history, and it'll be interesting to see. I think some of them will weather it just fine, but I suspect there will be uh, a sort of manifestation of real anger toward women. I think I, I worry that there will be a blowback that hating women or resenting them or not trusting them will sort of take on a veneer of acceptability. Um, in a really kind of reductive, unhelpful way, obviously mm -hmm. unhelpful. Um, and so the question is, is this just collateral damage or do we need to hit the brakes hard now and try to yeah. reframe? I, yeah, I worry about that too, because I worry that what is happening with a lot of these men, and I'm not talking about like the famous guys or the rich guys or whatever. I'm just talking right. about the regular guys who, you know, just had normal jobs and whatever. Um, is that they, if they feel kind of unfairly wronged, and I mean, being being ostracized from your, your friend group or from society is probably like one of the worst possible punishments. Um, it's really hard and awful. So what I think they'll end up feeling is a lot of resentment as opposed to um, sort of looking at what they did, trying to change their behavior, wanting to be accountable, wanting to understand how their behavior felt to a woman um, and why it was harmful. Instead, they just feel like there's nowhere to go and they're stuck hiding in their parents' house for the rest of their lives. And I'm not sure that that's productive again because I feel like I feel like what we want from this Me Too conversation is a like for women to be allowed to talk about these things that happen to them um, and b for men to change their behavior and be accountable for their behavior and we're not leaving room for that to happen and yeah like I think that I'm worried that we'll just end up with a lot of really bitter angry men who feel right. shut out and not able to do anything about it. Yeah. And men already have a very limited emotional bandwidth. I think that one of the things that gets left out of the conversations about, about sexism is that men are, they're not they're We talk about how women aren't allowed to show anger, but men are not allowed to show very much other than anger a lot of the time. They're not allowed to show fear. They're not allowed to show sadness. Um, I, I do think we're due for a sort of, you know, some kind of referendum on how men feel about turning down sexual overtures from women. You know, I, I actually wrote a whole piece for Medium about this notion of toxic femininity. Yeah, and I, I read was, it. I was playing around with it. Obviously, this is a I, like toxic masculinity. I think toxic femininity should be, uh, you know, put out to pasture. I, I don't think I, I think toxic. I think we've 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 had enough of toxins. We don't need to talk about what's toxic, other than unless we're talking about literal, you know, waste dumps and chemical uh, spill off. But you know, I, I, I hear from men quite often that they've been in sexual situations where they didn't feel comfortable um, turning a woman down for sex, either because they thought that it was going to be emasculating for them, or they didn't want to hurt her feelings in a way that was going to cause her to make things difficult for them later. Um, I just think that we need to have a broader framework for talking about human behavior generally because this idea that only men can be manipulative gaslighting 
uh, abusive assholes is frankly really sexist. Yeah. Women can be awful. Yeah. And you know, going back to like how we how we remember ourselves in our early twenties, I think that another thing that happens with these very young feminists is that because they haven't had that much life experience because they're young, they haven't seen the full range of human behavior. I mean, if you had told me when I was 21, even 25 years old, that like women actually did make false accusations against men during divorce and custody disputes, that that wasn't like, you know, it, it's, it, it does happen that a, a woman would accuse a man of um, abusing the children or abusing her and, and it's not true. It's not that it happens like all the time, but it certainly does happen. And it's one of those things that you can't really get your mind around until you're older and you've gone through the world and you've met all kinds of people and you've seen all kinds of behaviors and you've heard all kinds of stories. And so I think that it's, I think that we have this sort of narrative um, of, of women as not necessarily innocent, but morally superior. Women have been granted a kind of moral authority um, that's really very limiting. I mean, that goes back to denying people their complexities. You're, you're, you're denying us our humanity uh, as people who are capable of, of terrible things as well as, as great things. Yeah, but, and I mean, uh, it's sort of, yeah, and we, I think you're right that it's totally sexist, like, to say, you know, women are somehow inherently good and men are somehow inherently worse or bad. Um, and and it does, it is dehumanizing. And I think that we criticize the dehumanization of women all the time, which is good, because we should criticize the dehumanization of women because it happens all the time. Um, and, but at the same time, I think that we end up dehumanizing men um, when we put them in categories like that and I I found that essay interesting and there was some there was a lot of stuff I agreed with and a lot of stuff I didn't agree with which is fine <laughs> that's but, the whole idea <laughs> I mean the worst thing is when somebody said I agree with every single thing you say I'm like oh yeah you're like really um so right. yeah and I mean one of those things is just like because I don't I mean I don't use the term toxic masculinity or toxic femininity although I do see that term thrown thrown around a lot toxic toxic masculinity anyway in mainstream and liberal feminism um and I I mean yeah the, the thing that I part, thought was most interesting about that essay was the your conversation about sex and the way that women assume that men are always up for it and that if they're not up for it that's like a real blow to their masculinity or there's something wrong with them they're or not gay. a real always man like, oh, he doesn't he doesn't like me uh so he must be gay right yeah. that, that's back in my day that was the, our sort of go-to excuse right yeah he just wasn't that into us <laughs> yeah and i mean i guess it's it's yeah it's a weird pressure that we put on man, men and I mean I feel like I'm guilty of that too and I, part of that's just been my I think particular experience with boyfriends who constantly pestered me for sex and was like leave me alone <laughs> so I guess I probably would naturally make those assumptions about men but yeah I, th I think it's probably quite difficult for for men to to navigate that because they, you know, don't want a woman to feel rejected or they don't want to feel emasculated or they don't want to be made fun of or they don't want to be insulted or whatever. And I guess, yeah, I guess I, I sort of feel like we could be having broader conversations about how gender stereotypes impact everyone in a negative yes. way. And I think those conversations are being had. I don't want to suggest that they're completely absent. Um, I just get I get a little tired, or a lot tired, of this just constant refrain. You know, I see I see pieces being written about how you know just being a woman and getting out of bed and facing down the patriarchy every morning makes you a total badass, and uh, so somehow that it, it just being a woman is in itself such an oppressive condition that you know simply doing the bare minim minimum to to keep yourself uh alive and paying your rent and going to work every day is, is some kind of heroic feat like i, I find that incredibly insulting fr frankly um 
And so I do, and, and, and again, and then it, you, know, you can extrapolate to this idea that it, in any given sexual encounter, the, the man has the upper hand. I don't think that's true at all. Obviously, men on balance are physically stronger than women. There are all sorts of factors that, make, that can make a situation riskier for a woman in, in a physical sense. So let me just get that out of the way, obviously. But um, I think that once you, you know, putting that aside, there's all sorts of emotional risks. And there are all sorts of ways in which women are master manipulators, not to be gender essentialist about this, but women are um, far better at men that, at gaslighting uh, than, than men, I'd say. Well, in I, the aggregate. Women are masters of that dark art. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think, I, I mean, I think the other thing is that like it's not the kind of the kind of experiences that women especially young women have in sexual relationships with or sexual situations with men like it's not it's not this overt coercion often it's sort of like a woman i'm speaking from my own experience but i know that probably most other women have had this experience too whether or not they want to admit to it or not um is that you like, you feel like you want to perform, and you feel like... So you do perform, and so you maybe pretend to enjoy something you don't enjoy, or you pretend to want something that you don't want because you want to make that man want you, or want to make that man happy, or want to turn him on, or you want him to be your boyfriend, you want to keep him, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so it's... I mean... <laughs> It's so hard to have this conversation, but I, I mean, there should be, I do think that there should be some accountability in terms of women doing that. Like, it's like, well, stop performing. A, because it puts a lot of pressure on the rest of us to enjoy something that isn't enjoyable because you're telling this dude you really like this, like, really not fun, painful right. thing or degrading thing. And now he just goes around thinking all women want to be choked or have anal sex or whatever it is. Yeah, right. It's like, fuck, this, stop. Like, don't. That, again, this gets back to this generational divide. I, as a Gen Xer, experienced none of that. I mean, I, a lot of this is a phenomenon of internet pornography because yeah, yeah. The, the choking, I was just talking to a friend my age recently about this and we were just like have you ever been choked or has this ever come up or like what is this we were like no I, this is completely uh, alien to us so so again i do think we need to be mindful of the ways things have changed uh, people could, were not could not just watch porn uh all day every day back in the 1990s and the 1980s it was no. a very different yeah, and those those acts and that kind of violence wasn't yeah. normalized and no. sexualized like it is now. Like it wasn't normal to to choke your partner in bed or hit your partner or you know right. perform all these weird, complicated like sexual positions or like have to. I don't know. Like it's just. See, I, I wish the conversation would be about that and not about. Um, power dynamics necessarily between men and women, because this is something that everybody, that's affecting everybody. Um, and I, I just, I, 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 w I wish that instead of talking about how uh, women are performing for men and, and why are we pandering to the patriarchy or however we're gonna put it, let's talk about just the overall effect of this particular aspect of the digital revolution, which is that all th these sorts of sexual behaviors have become not just normalized, but expected. And a lot of older people who are, you know, getting frustrated by the conversation don't realize that at all. And, and we think it's about something else. But I, yeah, I would, I would also want to know if like, it seems to me that men perform in relationships all the time as well in order to get women to have sex with them or like them or be impressed with them or be their girlfriend. Maybe it doesn't necessarily come out in troubling, potentially destructive ways in the bedroom, but we all perform. That's, that's human nature. I don't think any, any one gender has a monopoly on performance and mm -hmm. fakery right. <laughs> to get what. Yeah. I mean, so I guess I'm, 
we, we should probably wrap up soon because I've taken up an hour of your time now. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Dog has been quiet. Though. Yeah. <laughs> Sleep. <laughs> Only just a few little barks there and then she settled down. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, so I've, I, like I said, I'm kind of going through this process where I'm wanting to have different conversations. I'm wanting to talk to different people. I'm wanting to talk to people who are kind of not the kinds of people that I'm supposed to talk to, according to the left or to feminism. And it's been difficult, but I'm trying to be kind of public about it because I don't want anyone to be caught off guard when I, like, have a conversation with Ben Shapiro or whatever. Like, <laughs> I kind of like him. I think, I mean, we disagree with, with so many things, obviously, but I find him, like, quite a logical, compelling, ethical person. So I guess, I mean, that's even that's, like, an awkward thing to say, right? Like, it's hard to say, like, okay, well, I disagree with this person on, like, so many different things. But then at the same time, I am I find some of what he says really quite interesting. Um, yeah, no, I mean, this idea that if you are in any way adjacent to somebody whose ideology has been uh, deemed problematic or wrong, that somehow you are then problematic. I, I just don't, this idea, it's like this guilt by association. And that is just, it's, it's incredibly stupid. Um, and it's really too bad because it's shutting down a lot of, a lot of important debate. And like, I would love to hear you talk with Ben Shapiro. I actually, <laughs> you like him more than I do, it sounds like. I, I wish he would stop with the, like, you know, liberal tears, coffee mugs, and all that sort of gotcha, stuff. Gotcha, yeah. He's really smart. He's, I, I guess he's, I don't watch him, I, I don't watch him or read him enough to really um, make any informed uh, critique. So I'll, I'll leave it at there. I don't like his coffee mug, that's all. Get, get his coffee mug. Um, I, yeah, so, yeah, and, and, I mean, so I guess, like, part of my, part of what's going, is not just conversations, but I feel like I'm starting to change my mind about certain things that, and that's, like, another awkward thing to do in public, and so, but I, I mean, I think it's courageous, but I think some people see it as weakness, or, you know, oh will be, like, but it's, like, the essence of thinking. Yeah, yeah. Zadie Smith's collection of essays is called changing my mind and it's it's very much about this i mean if you are going to be a person engaged with culture and art and literature and politics and ideas it's entirely about changing your mind i mean what if you're not going to change your mind what else are you going to do with it yeah you're not using it no I want, so is there anything that you changed your mind about? Like, did you have any, like, really, like, hard stance on something that you sort of had to change your mind about and come out about? Um, hard stance. I mean, if it was a hard, I don't think I had a hard stance. I think there were probably things that I didn't really think very much about. And so I just kind of went along with, um, with what my pack had decided was the correct opinion. Mm -hmm. Um... I mean, I don't know. It's something like, I mean, I guess if anything, I mean, if if somebody was to say, if you, if you were a single issue voter, what would your issue be? And I'm not really a single issue voter, but if I had to answer that question, I would probably say abortion. Like I am extremely pro-choice. I really, I, I, that would be, a deal breaker for me in a romantic relationship, for instance, it would be, I can't imagine voting for a candidate who was in any way soft on that. Um, but at the same time, I completely understand from an intellectual perspective, what would make somebody anti-choice. I understand if, if you are, if you have a religious perspective, if you're coming at it, like Ben Shapiro, for instance, from what I understand, he's very intellectually consistent on this. If you believe that abortion is murder, you can definitely make the case for that. Um, and I think that part of the problem with the, the, the pro-choice movement has been very, you know, for strategic reasons, um, very resistant to nuance within that discussion at all. I think it's very dangerous. I think having a discussion about um, when does life begin 
is there a difference between terminating a pregnancy at six weeks versus 12 weeks versus 16 weeks? They don't want to talk about that at all because it's going to hurt hurt their position. Mm. And so, like, from my perspective, I kind of don't want to talk about it either because it's so important to me uh, to keep those rights intact. But, like, if I'm really being intellectually honest, I would say, well, those are those are questions worth asking. Um, and if they, you know, rock the boat, I don't know. So yeah, so that would be that would maybe be an example. I guess I no longer think I, I, I no longer think that pro life people are just stupid and hate women and want to control women's bodies. Yeah, that's I mean, maybe a few of them, but it's not that simple. Yeah, I mean, that's that's something I changed my mind on really recently, too, because I mean, I, I want all women and including myself to have access to abortion no matter what the truth is oh, yeah. what the debate I, is so i just don't care i'm like all. you might be right but i'm i still want us to have to access to abortion right. and the reality is that i do value the life of an adult grown woman more than an unborn fetus so you but i mean of course there's other conversations to be had about it and I don't, I, I really believe that most people who are pro-life are doing what they think is right. Like they are, yeah. they, they care about society. They care about people. They care about the world. And they, this is what they think is the right and ethical thing to do. And just because we disagree with them doesn't mean that they're bad or evil or like you said, that they hate women and, and that we are not we're on the opposite of end of the spectrum and we're right and good and i mean we those kind of debates come up in all sorts of places but it's like you no know, it's not as simple as that it's not as simple as that and and i don't think that it's helpful to vilify people in that way unless you really don't want to understand you know? i think people don't i think that certainty is such a comfort often and uncertainty is really discombobulating. And so, you know, if the, you scratch beneath the surface of anything really, and it's gonna be a lot more complicated than the, than the conventional wisdom or the public consensus or the Twitter narrative or whatever it is. And it's very disturbing. Like it's viscerally and emotionally very disturbing to enter into a realm where you see complications where once you just assumed everything was simple and you were on the right side. So in that sense, I guess it's understandable that there's so much resistance to the dreaded nuance. <laughs> but we have to, maybe we have to like, we have to like make nuance more palatable. I feel like that's my goal. And mainstreaming people, nuance, <laughs> make nuance, great again <laughs> a happy face on nuance yeah um cool it's been really great to talk to you i really appreciate it again and i hope that we'll get a chance to talk more in the future about yeah, more. Likewise. yeah yeah yeah, yes. yeah i hope our crowds paths cross in in uh, real life yeah That's definitely so all right well megan thanks thank you good to talk to you sure. have a good night okay. take thanks. care bye, bye.